Well, let's continue in our discussion of uh, geosciences and in particular plate tectonics, which we'll get into this lesson. Now, the first lesson, we really tried to impress you with the fact that the Earth is not a static planet. There are a lot of things happening. Earthquakes and volcanoes and geysers. And in this lesson, we'll try to explain the basis for some of these activities of the Earth. I'm sure when you were uh, young, I know that I did, when I looked at, at, the, at the globe or a map and I looked at the continents, one of the things that occurs to you is that South America sort of fits into Africa. It's almost like you have a jigsaw puzzle and you just sort of put the pieces together. Uh, as early as 1620, Francis Bacon, who was uh, a noted English natural philosopher, remember natural philosophy was what we called scientists back then, after the cartographers, the mapmakers, had first begun to describe the shapes of the different continents, Francis Bacon looked at, at the map and said, you know, these things kind of fit together. And uh, he even suggested that maybe the continents at one time were joined. Well, Bacon was ahead of his time at that point because the idea didn't really resurface until 1912 with uh, a meteorologist, a German meteorologist named Alfred Wegener, who proposed continental drift. That is, he came back to this idea that the continents looked like they could fit together, and he studied this from a scientific point of view. And he noted that certain minerals or rocks that you could find in certain continents that you could find similar rocks and minerals in other continents if you sort of arrange them or place them together, such as shown in this slide. More interestingly, he found that there was fossil evidence. That is, if he if you looked at the fossil record for certain species, you would find, and I won't go through each of these, but you can see that he found evidence that the fossils for certain species could be, could be found in South America and in Africa or in some cases South America, Africa, and on into even Antarctica and Australia, suggesting that for this to, for, the, for these species to have existed in all these different locations, that maybe that, that it was all one landmass at one time. So he proposed what was called the continental drift hypothesis, that the continents were at one point in, in time were part of a single landmass that they then began to drift apart. Well, this idea still was a little early for most scientists to, to accept. But then, over a period of time, additional evidence came about which has led scientists to revisit this and to modify this uh, hypothesis of Wegener's. One important piece of evidence is from mapping the ocean floors and finding that, in fact, there are mountain ranges uh, in the oceans. Now, of course, they're not high enough to be above sea level. For example, between the North American and South American continents and Europe and Africa, there is a ridge or a mountain range, and I'm tracing it with my little my cursor here. And the, on the right, I have this sort of blown up in one particular region, and you can see that there's a, there's a very large mountain range that separates North America from Europe. So information such as this began to become uh, available, mapping the ocean floors. Additionally, and there is evidence that the magnetic north and south pole of planet Earth uh, switches every million years or so. Now, this seems very strange to us, uh, and, and the mechanism for the reversal of the magnetic pole of Earth is, is not known or understood, maybe some hypotheses, but it's not understood well. But nevertheless, there is evidence that the direction of the magnetic North Pole has switched from the North, what we think of as the North Pole, to Antarctica, the South Pole, and every million years or so it, it tends to, to change direction. Now, the reason this provides evidence for for something happening with respect to uh, the continents drifting is that there are also, besides being mountain ranges in the ocean, there are also fissures, that is sort of valleys, where it appears that new ocean floor is formed constantly. And if you sort of look at these fissures and you look at the distance from these, these cracks, 
they have found that the direction of the magma, which has solidified to form the ocean floor, that its magnetic orientation changes with distance. That is, sometimes the magnetic dipole of the material that has sort of been solidified points to the North Pole, and then sometimes it points to the South Pole. That there is a pattern, and the best explanation for this is that there's new ocean floor being formed at that fissure point. Also, the age of the rock that is forming this new ocean floor, presumably from magma being solidified as rock, that the age of this rock depends upon the distance from those fissures. So there's evidence of sort of sea floor expanding. Now, if in fact the the ocean floors are expanding in some places, they must be cramming together in other places. That is, we must have some places where things are moving together and some places where things are moving apart. Additional evidence that the North and South America and Europe and Africa are moving apart comes from radio telescope data. Now, this is a little bit complicated to get into, but it turns out that radio telescopes, which are actually measuring the distance between the Earth and a quasar in space, that scientists have located one of these radio telescope detectors in Massachusetts and one in Germany, and they are looking at a fixed quasar and, and measuring the distance to that quasar, and it's almost like you have two measurements from the same common point at the, where my pencil tips are coming together, and what they're taking advantage of is sort of a triangulation, and that if in fact these two observation points are moving apart, and I'm trying to spread my pencils apart a little bit as I go, then they, this is what they have measured as a function of time, and they've been, then been able to determine that the distance between the erasures of my pencils has been increasing by about five centimeters per year. That is, the distance between Massachusetts and Germany has been spreading apart at about five centimeters per year. Now, at this rate, this is not very fast. Five centimeters is like, like um, a couple of inches. Uh, it's not a very fast movement of the two continents away from each other. But over a long period of time, that is, you could then extrapolate back and say that maybe 140 million years ago, the two continents, the Americas and Europe and, and Africa, maybe these, these continents were, were together. Now, 140 million years is a long, long time, but if you compare that to the best estimates of the age of planet Earth of 4.6 billion years, you can see that 140 million is, is not so long. Now, this notion that continents were at one time joined together to form one large single landmass was originally suggested by Wegener, and he coined the term Pangea. And in this next slide, I'm going to show you some best guesses of what Pangea would have looked like and how it is spreading apart. Now, you'll have to look very, very carefully. So I'm wanting to set this up so that you uh, watch while I click this, because it's going to be a, a simulation. You see that? So this would be Pangea, and I'll try to see if it works. Okay. There you go, again. So this is the geoscientist's best idea of what Pangea would have looked like and how all these land masses would have been joined together and then they would have spread apart over a hundred over and then they would be spreading apart over a hundred to two hundred million year time period. From this evidence, scientists now, instead of talking in terms of the continental drift, talk about a plate tectonic theory. That is, this is a theory in which the Earth's outer crust, its outer surface, comprises 12 or more plates, 12 large plates and maybe some smaller plates. Plates are what you could consider to be rafts that sort of form the complete crust. But these 12 plates are not really joined, but they float around and they rub against each other or they sometimes clash into each other and that this movement of the plates is responsible for such things as volcanoes and earthquakes and other things that we will be talking about shortly. So a continental tectonic plate 
continental meaning one in which there's a land mass like like North America or Australia, a land mass. A continental tectonic plate is thought to be made of a rigid plate of rock which could be 35 kilometers in total thickness, that's about 20 miles, made of, made of granite and capped with basalt. An oceanic plate would be thinner, about 10 kilometers, maybe about 6 miles in thickness, made of very dense basalt covering mantle rock. Now, some of these plates contain both continents and extend out into the oceans, as we will see in the, in the next slide. The North American plate, the one we are riding on, uh, includes most of the continent of North America, plus Greenland, uh, and extends eastward into the Atlantic Ocean and actually a little bit westward to Russia, as you'll see in the next slide. So this next slide will show you a drawing of what we believe to be these 12 main tectonic plates. And as you can see, if we'll look up at the top, the brown one here, the North American plate, including North America, Greenland, and as I said, some of Russia, and the Eurasian plate carrying Europe and Russia and the other countries in Asia, the African plate, we have an Indian plate, uh, South American plate, and notice that it would carry both South America, the continent, plus extend out into the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, we have an Australian plate, and plus uh, oceanic areas around it, and then a very large Pacific plate, plus a few other smaller plates, as you can see in various places. So this is our current idea that these land masses float on these plates, and these plates again are rubbing past each other and sometimes cramming into each other in ways that we will cover in the next uh, in the next lesson. Now what drives the movement of these plates? Why aren't they just sort of static and, and happy just to stay put? Well there's a lot of thermal energy in the Earth's interior which we think drives this motion. This thermal energy is caused by uh, the decay of, of radioactive elements, primarily uranium, this radioactive decay produces a lot of heat and the core beneath the Earth's crust is very, very hot. And a combination of this heat and the pressure melts the rock in the Earth's core, forming liquid magma. Now, this liquid magma acts just like boiling water in a sense. That is, this heat moves by convection rather than conduction. That is, complete masses of the magma move as a, as a group and sort of percolate up until it reaches the brittle crust, the outer crust, at which time it will ooze out from the cracks wherever it can. And basically that is what happens with volcanic eruptions or when we have magma seeping out between these fissures and solidifying, forming new seabed floor. Now, returning briefly to our ring of fire, I want to show you how this aligns with the various plates. Uh, if you remember, we had this uh, set of volcanoes, these little black triangles. But if you follow my cursor and you also look to the right to the map of these tectonic plates, you can see that, in fact, the volcanoes tend to be located sort of exactly at the boundaries between these plates. And you see, if you look over the right, you can see that I would almost be the same as tracing out some of the boundaries between these plates. Then going up around J Japan and then the Aleutian Islands, and notice that this is sort of defining the Pacific plate. Then down the North American plate until we get to the South American plate. You can see that the tracing of the boundaries between these plates determines that the tracing of the boundary between these plates shows us the location of where we would expect to find all this volcanic activity. So with the plate tectonic theory, we begin to have an explanation for why we have volcanoes at certain places. Okay, we're going to pause now and have a little quiz and come back. And when we come back, we'll talk about what happens at these boundaries when they either rub together or sort of collide with each other and the various consequences. Oh, what a, what a dynamic world we live in.